Good morning, good morning, good morning. And it is going to be a lovely morning this morning. 22 degrees. I'm bang on time. 8.15. Plenty of time to go the slow way. The scenic route. <coughs> That's my next door neighbour. Well, next door but one anyway. So, how are you? I trust you are well. I spent a day in Clacton yesterday, had a day off. So I went down the seaside, had a burger for lunch. What should we talk about today? <coughs> I'll tell you something funny that's happened, because my videos, which as I've always said already, just for my own personal, to do a brain dump, so that one day if I ever want to write a book on the weirder, aspects of being a dentist the stuff that's not taught at dental school and the stuff that's uh, uh, you don't learn unless uh, you've been in the job for 30 40 years <coughs> uh, one of them yesterday has uh, suddenly picked up 600 views which is I mean normally I get 30 views this thing when I look first had 630 so I'm thinking well that's strange because that's that's 600 more than normal, you know, why? Something's gone wrong. So anyway, I looked at it again this morning, it's got a thousand views now. So goodness knows what's going on. I mean, you honestly, I mean, I suppose you, you know, if you knew what you were doing, you could probably work out why, but uh, I don't know what I'm doing. So, and I'll, uh, I'll prove that to you in a minute. <laughs> but, um, no, I suppose it's been picked up by the search algorithm and sort of recommended to a few people. So, it's not, I don't, I don't make any money off of YouTube, don't you worry about that. So, what I'm going to talk about today is money. 25th of June, it's going to be closed. Right. So, money. Now, and, and what I'm going to tell you about, right, will, will help you be wealthy. I mean, there's nothing worse than the blooming millennials and the Generation Alpha going on about how us boomers have all the money and we had all the benefits and all the, you know, all, all the opportunity to get on in life and everything and they've got nothing zero zilch. which I think is, is just a bit of nihilism. And not only that, probably just a bit of impatience as well, because, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortably off, and, and yet I'm coming up to 50 years of working as a dentist, if you include the five years I spent training. So, you're, you know, you can't have it all in the first five or 10 years. And, and we didn't have it all in the first five or 10 years either. I mean, I'm not saying that I was disadvantaged. Well, I was as a child, I was disadvantaged. But once I got into dental school through through my own on my own merits of brain power, that was really when my life changed and, and it turned my life around. You know, I was all of a sudden I was I was on a above average wage, let's put it that way, and therefore able to you know I had an above average ability to buy a house and bring up a family and go on foreign holidays and stuff like that. So that is true. But, you know, we, uh, uh, there, there was a lot of uh, things that we could have moaned about, um, but we didn't, you know, that we had no internet, we had, uh, uh, inflation was, uh, I don't know, uh, in excess of 15% at times, and so, and I blundered my way through all of that without really understanding money and how money works. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try and give you like a whistle-stop tour through what I've learned over the, over the years. 
And this is this is because of the internet. I've always said that you know, once people go over the fact you could download images and um, talk, you know, without having to pay the general post office for a phone line and uh, take images of whatever you like without having to worry about whether the the, the chemist at Boots is going to report you to the police, etc., etc., then people have a lot of people have. Um, learned about macroeconomics and money from the internet and it's proved to be a very popular subject because obviously people like money they you everyone uses money and we all want to be wealthy don't we so uh, also <laughs> this is, has come up as a suggestion because on my last video there was a rather large watch of money visible in the car reflected in the windscreen which was in transit from home to work and uh, you may wonder why I got large amounts of money on me and I'll tell you um, if I get any surplus money in the business I tend to withdraw it as cash um, I mean and we're not talking major amounts here we're talking like I think probably in the last uh, nine years I've withdrawn about £8,000. But that's because there's a difference between money in the bank and cash, right? Now, most people don't understand or realize this because what happens is you've got £100 in cash. You pay it into the bank, it comes up as £100 in your bank account, and there it is safe and, safe and sound, isn't it? But in fact, it's not at all as safe in the bank as it is in cash. I mean, it's not necessarily as safe in cash as I'm going to find out if I get waylaid on the way to work this morning. But, <laughs> but it's a different type of money, and that's really what you need to understand, right? Okay, right. Okay, angry. So how can there be more than one type of money? Right, well, here's the thing. Cash is what they call a bearer instrument. In other words, if whoever's got it can spend it. It has, technically, it's what they call sovereign debt, which means that, let's, for example, you're walking through the Australian outback, you find the biggest gold nugget that's ever been found. It then becomes your property and you haven't borrowed it off of anyone and you don't owe it to anyone. So it's, it's a sovereign wealth. In other words, it's just something that you own, right? Whereas money that's uh, created by the bank or given to you by the bank is not sovereign money. It's what they call debt-based money. They're the two types of basic types of money. Sovereign money and debt-based money. Now. Uh, gold and uh, Bitcoin are sovereign monies and uh, all government monies are debt-based monies. So <clears throat> the significance of the difference to you is that if you have, um, let's say you, you have like £10,000 in the bank and the bank goes bust, then you're, you can't, you're not entitled to walk into the bank and say, sorry to hear you've gone bust. I'd like to withdraw my £10,000. What they'll do is they'll say, well, Mr. Watson, actually, you're an unsecured creditor, and therefore you need to join that big queue that's snaking around the block. And uh, because what we've done is we put a limit on everybody drawing money out of um, £200 a week. And if you want your £200, then, then obviously you'll, you'll need to queue up. And this happened in Cyprus. I mean, I'm not making this up. This happens, happened in Cyprus. And uh, people with uh, who, who have money in the bank resorted to robbing the bank. They actually went in with guns and stuck the bank up and said, give me my cash, uh, which is not really, uh, you know, not viable. So the next thing you're going to say, well, yeah, but my money's guaranteed up to £75,000 or £85,000 per account. If the bank goes bankrupt, I can, I can, I'm guaranteed to get my money. And, and the answer to that is yes and no. 
And when it push comes to shove, it's going to be mainly no. Because they are quite likely to say, yes, you do, you know, you've got £75,000 guaranteed, but you can only withdraw it at um, £200 a week, right? So that's the first thing. You, you'll, you can, you'll have the money, but you won't have the money. Right? And the second thing is that most of us bank with the big banks like Lloyds and HSBC, Barclays and NatWest and all that. And if Lloyds was to go down, Lloyds is a big bank, that would probably do, do the, the guarantee fund in just on the basis of Lloyds collapsing. They could probably cope with the collapse of a smaller bank. But in the UK, we don't really have any regional banks anymore. There's smaller banks like Metro Bank in London and stuff like that. But if Lloyd's collapsed or was approaching collapse and couldn't guarantee deposits, then it would be probably in the context of a wider problem with the banks. In other words, it wouldn't just be Lloyd's that would be in trouble, it would be NatWest and it would be HSBC in the UK, etc, etc. And therefore the fund would come nowhere near to, to uh, uh, covering what it promises to cover. It's it's really just it's like a rainy day fund for the for the odd little bank that fought fails, like your Northern Rocks, not not the big the big guys, right? The big guys have been need to be bailed out by the government. Now, supposing we take let's say a hypothetical hundred pounds in cash and you and you put it in the bank then the bank creates a credit on your account of £100 and a debit in their account of £100 to show that they, they owe it to you. And they take your money. Now, the thing about banks and, the, and why banking licences are so sought after is that banks are literally a licence to print money. I mean, they literally, that is what a banking licence is. It is literally a license to print money, to create money. So if you go in and say, I want to borrow £100,000 to start up a dental surgery, the bank will look at your proposition and they'll tell you what the interest rate is. And if you agree, they will create the money. They'll just create 100,000 credit in your account and 100,000 debit in their account to show that you owe them the, the money. And then that money will be created instantly uh, at the push of a button. And of course they will charge interest on that money. So what they're doing is, this is why the banks want such a good thing, because they're selling something that they cost them nothing and they can create a will. So who wouldn't want to be a bank, you know? I mean, you've got literally the ability to create money at the push of a button and sell it into the market, uh, whatever the consumer's paying, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine percent whatever. <clears throat> and if you muck up, then the government comes to your aid. And the customer becomes an unsecured creditor. So he goes to the back of the line for the, you know, with the payouts after the shareholders and the secured, uh, the senior debt, you know, any other banks or anything that they owe money to, venture capitalists, whatever, you, you, you're the last, you're the lowliest of the lowly. So putting your money in a bank is not necessarily a smart idea. Certainly not keeping large amounts of money in a bank is not a smart idea. Keeping large amounts of money under your mattress is probably not such a smart idea either. But uh, that's what you do. You pay your money and you take your choice. What I do prefer to have some cash on reserve because, as we found out, at the end of the day, if um, you know, if, if you need it, then you need it. You know, we've had situations where. 
uh, we haven't had credit failures, but we've certainly had failures in supply of um, diesel power, for example, or toilet rolls or whatever, you know, I mean, you have to be a little bit prepared. And while you've got your three months worth of baked beans in, in your spare bedroom, you know, <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, nobody eats baked beans normally. So why they keep three months supplies of spare, I don't know. But you also need to have a little bit of a little bit of diesel in a few cans in your garage and you need to have a bit of cash. But my point is that they're fundamentally different types of money. And when you pay money into the bank and when you take money cash out of the bank, then what you're doing is you're interconverting, you're converting between the two different types. The, uh, another type of money, <coughs> excuse me, would be a central bank digital currency. And that's going to, I think, increasingly come into the news now. Uh, the Chinese are going for central bank digital currencies, full blast. The, uh, Donald Trump has just said if he's elected, then he will never have a central bank digital currency. The public on the, for the most part, I think, are divided between don't like it, if they know about it, and, uh, or don't know about it. So how can you define a central bank digital currency? Well, having just said that uh, central bank money, which is cash money, pound notes, etc., is, is sovereign debt and... Uh, and probably slightly preferable to uh, credit-based debt from a bank. You might think, well, this is great because here's all the micro, uh, the uh, wing, what's they call them, the uh, flyers. This is where they all fly from. So, um, you know, why can't I have an account at the central bank? That suit me great because. For a start, uh, the Bank of England's interest rates, the base rate is almost always lower than um, is almost always lower than the, the the interest rate that's charged by the retail banks. And in fact, the idea that the the Bank of England might start creating uh, bank accounts is is a big threat to the uh, retail banks because they make their money or, or some of it out of uh, you know servicing retail customers and they don't really want to go into competition with the Bank of England that would you know possibly charge lower interest rates so but the whole point about the central bank issuing the currency is that it would be a digital currency uh, in other words it would all be done online and so um, the central bank and, and through them the government would have pretty much 100% visibility into everything, every every bit of money and where it went and where it was spent. And I think a lot of this is uh, accounts for the opposition to it on um, grounds of privacy. Because in the same way as you know the Department of Health would like to know every uh, Bit of money that was spent on every cotton wool roll and every mirror probe that dentist bought so that they could then uh, see where uh, they might be able to uh, pay less the central bank and the bank of england and the government would probably would probably also like to see have, have total visibility into spending obviously with a view of maximizing tax receipts i would have imagined and also you know and also targeting their political opponents and uh, and bringing and introducing some sort of social credit score where you know if you eat McDonald's five times a week um, you're gonna <clears throat> possibly have restricted access to NHS appointments and stuff like that which is which already goes on in China so that brings us to another couple of types of money uh, the sovereign money Bitcoin which I think is, you know, again, this is whenever Generation Alpha complains that 
you know, what have the boomers ever done for us? I think the boomers and the millennials have, have gifted Bitcoin to Generation Alpha, and it's the best thing we could have done, given them a, a sovereign, independent money that they can use to um, store their wealth in a way that uh, isn't eroded by government overspending. And the big distinction you have to understand with Bitcoin, between Bitcoin money and other money, is that Bitcoin is digital money. It's digital as opposed to digitized, okay? Digital money is money that is literally exists in a digital form, a series of ones and zeros. And it can be transferred from A to B. I could have it on my phone, I can send it to someone else, they will then have it on their phone. It only exists in one place at any one time. Or technically the private key to allow you to spend it only exists in one place at any one time. But the actual money itself is, is actually getting transferred. Not title to the money, not claim on the money, the actual money. So next time uh, the people tell you that like a central bank digital currency is the same as it's like a Bitcoin type thing. First of all, it's not because it's not decentralized. Secondly, it's government controlled and, and open to debasement. And thirdly, it's not digital money, it's just digitized money. It's just the same as when you pay £100 in a bank and you look at your bank balance and it's got £100 in it, all they've done is they've just <coughs> represented your balance in terms of the digits. What you're looking at is a balance. You're not looking at the actual money, you're looking at their debt to you. And then, I mean, lastly, there are there are all sorts of other things that could be used as money or have been used as money. For example, the uh, Oyster cards in London, and transport, travel cards, they could be loaded up with any amount of money. So if you owed someone 50 quid and they used the tube a lot, you could give them um, an Oyster card with 50 quid on it. And they could go to any station and check this, you just hold it up against the reader and they'll tell you how much money's on the card. And so that's that's a type of money. And in fact, you know, if you gave someone an Oyster card, there'd be no record of any financial transaction between the two of you. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that you do it, but you know, you could pay your gardener every week with a couple of Oyster cards or whatever. <clears throat> And then there are the gift cards, which are a lot like used a lot in America, not so much in the UK. But um, there was a, a problem with Amazon gift cards, for example. Uh, a lot of Amazon workers did work for Amazon, and they were paid in gift cards rather than money. And they got to the point where these Amazon workers had so many gift cards and so much money on gift cards that they didn't know what to do with them and they wanted to exchange them for cash. <laughs> but <clears throat> the problem was that um, they couldn't prove that these gift cards had the money on them that they claimed. There was no sort of Oyster type thing where you could scan an Amazon gift card and it would tell you how much money was on it. So they had to come up with a scheme whereby if anybody wanted to buy anything on Amazon, they would log on this website and they would then buy it for them uh, at possibly 10% discount or something and they would have for their £100 gift card they would have £90 in cash or in their bank and whatever and then they would arrange for the goods to be sent to the person who's who, who's paid the money who would then get uh, um, they would then get £100 worth of goods for £90 so, and that was a problem that arose literally because you couldn't, there were a lot of people with Amazon gift cards who couldn't, um, didn't want to spend them and, um, and couldn't resell them. And that was the idea. That's why you couldn't, you couldn't find out what that was on them because Amazon didn't want people to sell them. 
but it, it's all sort of backfired, you know. As Jeff Goldblum said, nature finds a way. So, welcome to my 1,000 new viewers. This, hopefully this one will be back at 35. It's a bit of a pressure, you know. But what I've done, I've just sort of taken you through all the types of money there. And of them all, I would say probably in terms of pure functionality, in terms of definition of ideal money, pure money, the best is Bitcoin. Second best is cash. For operating a business, you, you, you need to operate a business bank account that you really can't get around that. And then central bank digital currencies, avoid them like a plague. And gift cards, is they're, they're on the periphery anyway. So if you want to muck about with them, then, then by all means do. But um, I had an idea the other day that, um, that what the government should do is as, as the spending power of money decreases, uh, due to overprinting and running government deficits, um, they should reduce the size of the of the notes. So I think, like in five years' time, if you know they're only worth ninety percent, then what they should do is they should shrink them down to ninety percent, so people would literally be able to see their money shrinking in front of their eyes. The problem with that is that after about fifty years, all, all the pound notes would be about this big. So. <laughs> They'd be the size of postage stamps, so that's not going to fly. But it's an excellent idea. And if in the current election, by some fluke, I am elected as Prime Minister, that will be what I would do within the first 100 days. I'll bring in a law that cash money has to represent its purchasing power by virtue of its surface area. Okay, you can have that idea free of charge. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye.